And we begin your mink study review, spring internal organs, with the teeth and a rather vicious looking mink. So if you look between what we commonly call the fangs, you see a spectacular set of teeny tiny little teeth located between the tweezers. And these are the incisors. As we rotate the mink just slightly, you can see an over, overlapping pair of fangs, technically called the canines. Right behind the canines is that single pointed tooth above and below, best looking one right there, you can see another teeny tiny one right there, and that is what we call the premolar, that single pointed tooth. And right behind the premolars in the upper and lower jaw, we kind of reflect that skin back a bit. You've got a great view of the upper carnassial and a good view of the lower carnassial. There's a couple more premolars, but carnassials in the back of the mouth, the double pointed tooth. You'll notice in this mink, the neck and chest have been very well dissected. And one of the things that has been exposed is the larynx and the trachea. So if I were to ask you a question, and I asked you to observe this structure between the tweezers, the entire structure has the name larynx. On the other hand, and I'm going to zoom in, when I pull on this, create a little tension, we can see that our larynx is subdivided into a top half and a bottom half. So if I were to ask you to identify this cartilage of this organ, not tell you that it's the larynx. You would have to know that. On the top half, the larynx is the thyroid larynx. Excuse me, the thyroid cartilage. Now the bottom half of the larynx, if I were to ask you to identify the cartilage of this portion of this organ, it's a little darker brown, bottom half, it's the cricoid cartilage, or cricoid if you prefer. And if I were to simply say, identify this structure, simply the trachea. Now, if we take a look at the very top of the larynx, there's a little triangular flap that sticks out kind of like a tongue. Sometimes we refer to it as being triangular in nature, and that is the epiglottis. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to snip it right in half at the trachea so we can look at it individually. So I'm gonna pause for just a moment. I now have the larynx pressed down on the paper towel. A midline incision has been made in the very back. And now you can see from the inside, another view of the epiglottis our little triangular flap. 
and you can see a slit. Very obvious on the right side, not quite so obvious on the left side, but you can see a little slit. And we can see there's a thin band of tissue above the slit. Try a slightly different approach. Ah, that's not going to work any better. But a little band of tissue just above the slit on either side. So if the question were to be, identify this tissue just above the visible slit, the response should be false vocal cords. Whereas below the slit, it appears to be more like a mound of tissue. Kind of like a little semi-lunar valve. But again, a mound of tissue. Should be kind of light beige in color. And these are the true vocal cords. True vocal cords. Now we're looking at the neck. And the neck, you can see a remnant of the trachea. But now that we have removed the trachea, you can see clearly a flattened muscular tube that I'm lifting up on right now. And that's the esophagus. We press those down into place. And on each side of those tubular structures, we see a pair of blood vessels. Blue and reddish or pink. And again, the same pair on the opposite side. Pink and blue. Now, the small blue blood vessels next to the trachea are the internal jugular veins. Internal jugular veins. The pink ones are the carotid arteries. The left and the right carotid arteries. We come down just below that and we're in the area of a major intersection. We look at this blue blood vessel right here and in minks it's a very long vessel. In humans it's quite short. And this is the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava. At this particular point it has a big branch to the left and a big branch to the right. And these are both called external jugular veins. Come off at about a 45 degree angle. Now this one you will actually be asked twice because best seen here on the right side, the external jugular vein courses through the neck muscle, sternomastoid muscle, and reappears literally on top of the muscle in the neck, which we see a somewhat obscured view of it right here because of connective tissue, and it is still external jugular vein. So I will ask it once from the inside, and I will ask it another time on the outside. And please keep in mind, I can ask it on the right, and I can ask it on the left. We're going to come down just a little bit more. And we take a look at our superior vena cava once more. And we see this blue little stub hanging around. And this is the internal thoracic vein. When the rib cage covered the chest, this came down and it ran down the front of the rib cage. And now that it is gone, we have only a little remnant behind. One more time. Internal thoracic vein. And if you'll notice right here, coming from behind, off of a different vessel, is a little pink stub. A little pink stub. And that is the internal thoracic artery also got cut away from the chest. 
Now when we look here through the chest, from here to about right here, through the chest, here to about right here, the same. The operative word is subclavian. So if I point to blue in the chest, subclavian vein. If I point to pink, subclavian artery. A set on the right, and of course, a set on the left. Subclavian vein, subclavian artery. Now once we reach this point about right here, and I'm going to shift just a little bit, we are no longer in the chest, but we're outside the chest wall and we're in the upper arm. Same blood vessel, it continues on, but new name because of new location. And so now in the upper arm, we use the word brachial brachial artery, and of course, brachial vein. A set on the right, and of course, as we swing over, a set on the left. Brachial vein, brachial artery. Come down a bit further, and we can see the heart. And we see three blood vessels associated with the superior aspect of the heart. Once more, superior vena cava. But we'll notice to the left of that, two red blood vessels, or pinkish. The very first one that comes off the aortic arch it's called the brachiocephalic artery. And your brachiocephalic artery gives rise to your right carotid artery and your right subclavian artery. The second branch that comes off the aortic arch is entirely left subclavian artery. It gives rise to the left carotid artery as well as the left subclavian artery, the continua continuation of exactly the same one. Now if I take the heart and I move it over to the mink's left side, you should see, as I adjust a little bit there with me, you should see behind the heart and descending down the right posterior wall of the chest, a blue vessel runs right down the right side of the vertebral column. And that one right there is the azygous vein, A-Z-Y-G-O-S, the azygous vein. I'm going to try something, so I'm going to put on pause for a moment. Again, I just zoomed in, and again, the azygous vein. And coming off the azygous vein are little blue branches called intercostal veins. Kind of tough to see, but here's one right here that I'm wiggling on right in between the tweezers, an intercostal vein. Right below it, a slightly larger intercostal vein, rather dark as opposed to dramatic blue. And it tore, but you can still see a remnant of it. Little rupture as well. A third intercostal vein. And wherever you have intercostal veins, 
you will have intercostal arteries, but they come off of the aorta, which is best seen from the opposite side. So we're going to put it on pause and flip. Unfortunately, the aorta, the largest artery in the body, came out a little brownish beigey as opposed to dramatic pink. But you can see the pink intercostal arteries coming off on the left side of the posterior chest wall. And you can see a nice intercostal vein and another intercostal vein that didn't get any latex. So a good view on the left side of, again, the posterior chest wall. Now, if we follow the aorta up, we can follow it backwards, and we can see the aortic arch. And we can see the brachiocephalic and the left subclavian artery coming off the top of the arch. And you'll notice again, the arch is rather beigey as opposed to red. Now we're gonna focus on the heart. And if we look, top right, Here's the right auricle. We don't call it an atrium because we're not looking inside. We rotate the mink, and here is a smaller, yet still chocolate brown, left auricle. This one you'll notice has been cut to sneak a peek on the inside. We look at the front of the heart, and right here below the right auricle is the right ventricle. Right below the left auricle is the left ventricle. The two ventricles are separated from one another by a slight indentation that runs down the front of the heart. And if I were to ask you to identify this indentation of this organ, it would be interventricular sulcus, S-U-L, C-U-S. Now there is another sulcus. If we pull up on the right auricle and push down on the top of the ventricle, right here, the very top of the ventricle, it is somewhat indented. And the indentation right at the top here, again, you're not getting the best view, is the coronary sulcus. So again, if I were to point right here and say, identify this indentation in this location, coronary sulcus. We pry open the heart, and we can see that the outer right wall is thin. The inner ventricular chamber has some latex in it that hasn't been cleaned away. So it's rather darkened by the deoxygenated blood. But look at this big muscular wall that separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle. So if I were to ask you to identify this partition, this is the interventricular septum, S-E-P-T-U-M, interventricular septum. Now we get an interview with blue latex of the right atrium. And over here, a partial view, it's got some coagulated blood in it, of the left atrium. And notice the thick, thick muscular wall of the left ventricle. very similar to that of our pig's heart. Now, if I take the heart and pinch it and pull it off to the side, you'll notice the pericardium is still in place. 
cut it in half, and then just peeled it off the heart and saved it so we would have an identifiable structure. Then we look below the heart and we see a very dark vessel. Should be dramatically blue, but it's located between the diaphragm and the bottom of the heart, and this is the inferior vena cava. You should have noticed that to the right and left side of the heart, there were no lungs. They are gone. But one little lobe that is left behind is the lobe that's tucked underneath the heart. Humans do not have it. No room. And this is what we call our intermediate lobe of the lung. Intermediate lobe. Lost a little piece of that right there. So now we're going to go on pause once more. I now have a mink with a nice set of lungs for you. So move that arm out of the way. And we rotate the mink slightly to its left side. We'll see on the right, we've got one, two, and a third lobe of the lung. So on the right side, you have what is called the apical lobe, the, the middle lobe is called the cardiac lobe, and that third lobe right down here which rests literally on the diaphragm, is therefore named the diaphragmatic lobe. On the left-hand side, so we rotate our mink, there's only two lobes, just like in humans, top and the bottom. But again, we use the word apical lobe for the uppermost one, and the diaphragmatic lobe for the lowest one. We come and we bend the mink so that you can see the muscular flap known as the diaphragm. On this side, it's got a bit of fat on it. And if we take the diaphragm and we flip it back out of the way, we can see a little bit of connective tissue right here. And this connective tissue has a name. It's called the falciform ligament. It attaches a portion of the diaphragm to the top of the liver. Now as we look at the liver, I'm going to cut away this string. The mink, as I mentioned before, has many lobes of liver, unlike the human. So the only thing I'm going to ask you to identify on the mink, whether I point to the right side, the middle, or the left side, you only have to identify the liver. Now on this particular mink, it's rather difficult to see the gallbladder because it's tucked inside. So we're going to switch minks real quick. And we're back to our original mink. And the nice thing about this mink is there's a gap between these two middle lobes of the liver. And so if we pry it open, or maybe if we just cut a little piece of it away, we have a better view of a little sac that's tucked right inside. I'm trying to pinch it. And that's the gallbladder. Now one of the things that you would find have difficulty in finding are the bile ducts. So in that particular situation, I'm going to have you refer to page six in your mink packet to 
know the, uh, the various bile ducts. Okay, now we're going to leave the liver and we're gonna take a look at the digestive system. And I just happened to one, have one nearby. This is a digestive system that's been removed from the mink so we can take a look at uh, abdominal anatomy uh, posteriorly in the mink more uh, clearly. So here's what we've got. Right up here with this midline incision is the stomach. And we can see that there's still a little stub of esophagus remaining from here to here. So if I were to ask you to simply identify this organ, it would be stomach. Now the stomach, if you take a look on page five, is divided into three regions. So if we look at the top one third, that which is closest to the heart, if I were to say identify this region, it would be cardiac region. On the other hand, the middlemost section from here to here, if I were to ask you to identify this middle portion, it's the fundic region. And the bottom one third where it's narrowed considerably we would call the pyloric region. The stomach has an inner curvature or inner edge and an outer curvature or outer edge. So if I gave you the question, identify this inner edge of this organ, it would be lesser curvature. On the other hand, the outer edge is referred to as the greater curvature. Now we look inside the lesser curvature of the stomach and there's some fat. And we actually give that fat a name. And we call this fat the lesser omentum. Whereas this fat that covers the small intestines like a blanket is what we call the greater omentum. In most of your minks, it had greatly shifted to one side, leaving the small intestines exposed, and they should be fully draped by this blanket of fat and CT. Now, if we go back to our stomach, and we pry it open and look inside, we can see a number of muscular ridges. So if I were to ask you to identify these ridges by name, we call it rugae, R-U-G-A-E. We close.